Well, you're on the home stretch. Friday afternoon is all looking good. All right, so I'm here to talk to you, um, and I'm going to feature the NASA program, uh, for starters at least, and then we'll go into some other uh, style guide that I've done too. But uh, I wanted to say very honestly that um, this week, or these last two days, um, I feel like I've been beamed in to a, sort of an alien planet, <laughs> and the language is totally unrecognizable. Um, but that's okay, you know, I mean, I, I, one thing I can assure you is there's not going to be a single reference to code in this presentation, and that should uh, be a relief. Uh, but you know, on another level, um, the reason I'm comfortable sharing this with you and being here today is, uh, first of all, Gina has been an absolutely uh, generous and uh, encouraging colleague. Uh, and I want to congratulate her on a credible first conference. <laughs> and secondly, I've met a lot of the speakers here, and uh, it's been very reassuring. There's a lot of IQ involved, and there are really some swell people there. You know. Thirdly, uh, yes, we did have something to do with one of the very first style guides in the country. And, um, and, and, and definitely for the federal government. Um, so it set the pace. I asked Gina when, when we started on this, why do you want me to speak? And she said, well, you kind of invented the, the style guide. Well, I wouldn't take credit for that, but we were early on, so there was some pioneering involved. And uh, you know, it's, uh, when I look back on it, now it's the 42nd anniversary of this program. That's a long, long time. Um, so what I want to do for you is um, we'll be showing visuals from the manual uh, that, that my colleagues, uh, Jesse Reed and Amy Smythe of the New York office of the Pentagram, they've re reissued the book, as you know, and referred to the Kickstarter campaign. And we're gonna look at that now. Um, and then we'll talk more about how that all happened uh, and, and some other style guides. But, um, the main thing I think is to keep in mind is that this was all done in another century, okay? If you get that, then, then please be kind. <laughs> we'll watch the video now from Kickstarter. This is shuttle launch control. The countdown stands at T minus 33 minutes, 10 seconds and counting. At the present time, everything going smoothly. We're looking for a launch on time at 7 a.m. T minus. 20 seconds and counting. I'm Richard Daney. I was privileged to be the design director for the National Aeronautic and Space Administration when it was redesigned, starting in 1974. T minus 15, 14, 13, T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, we want to begin. I think what spawned it is a lot of us felt that our country, as young as it was, still is, um, was way behind, uh, especially Europe, in terms of design's role in society. This looks like a good time for some good news here. The House passed uh, a space budget yesterday, which includes the vote for the shuttle. What? Yeah. The country needs that shuttle mighty bad. You'll see. When we got the RFP, uh, let's say we been a firm for only one year, the very idea of tackling something as Herculean as this with what would be an extremely small sized firm even in those times, it really defies the odds and uh, we were able to do it working day and night, but uh, we pulled it off. I think what distinguishes this project from anything I've ever been involved with and, and for, the, for most designers it was uh, extraordinary and high profile and, and very romantic unanswered questions and the excitement of what's really out there. The NASA manual was a great success in the sense that everything was put in it very succinctly, 
It was a unified program that really held together. It would uh, look great from miles away, whether it be on the spacecraft or on the side of a truck that was almost indestructible in print or some of the crude mediums that had to be dealt with. The answers were all there. It was really the complete document. And the fact that it is uh, it, it's not a logo, it is to be sure that, but that it was a true systems program that reached deeply, and the language was part of that. And I think what shocks people is that that was all in place. There's no longer theory. It's on every aircraft that, or every shuttle trainer when they went up did weightless tests and then these little T-38s you'd see flying in with the shuttle next side, alongside it. The infamous incident, it was in 92, I guess, that uh, Dan Golden had taken over the agency and was uh, flying into Ames Center, which had a big logo on the roof. And his comment was, can I change that? And they said, of course you can. Of all the programs, I've, I've been associated with so many design victories that it's, you know, I had an exhilarating career and I love it. But this was the toughest thing to swallow that uh, I ever had to deal with. It's a document. It's a real a moment in time. It raises the design principles to another level. There's nothing frivolous about it. It's not a passing whim or anything like that. It's not a flyer. It's a it's a design document. It's meant for the ages. That's why it was developed that way, and uh, I think it succeeds on that level. great undertaking to tackle one of the toughest assignments uh, known to man. So here you have it. What it, thank you. Thank you. So uh, the Kickstarter, you don't know what happens with that format and everything, so I just wanted to give you a summary of what happened at the end of the 30-month period in the automatic cutoff. We had achieved uh, roughly 9,000 backers at $80 a piece and a million dollars. Um, this meant that project could go totally forward and it was a that's what I call a rebirth so uh, it's it's born back again and it's a wonderful thing um, this is Bruce and I when we were just a couple of young boys uh, this is in 1975 the manual had just been published and it's in our our new offices at one Doug Hammarskjöld Plaza in New York um, at that time we were going to Washington about once a week uh, shuttling over there, and uh, and say at, at an important part in our career. Uh, when we said a very small office in the video, well, it was five people, and that included the receptionist. So uh, it was a, a, a skeleton staff for sure. We added people later, of course, and then uh, you know as we built out. Um, when I'm going to show you some pages now from Jesse and Hamish's uh, reissue book, and keep in mind as you look at it including um, this page about the NASA color. Everything in it is done, it's pre-digital, of course, because it's 74, 75. Um, and so we're talking about French curves and rapidographs and India ink and all that kind of stuff. For instance, if this is for large-scale use, a scale thing, if Marlowe, when he was doing this grid, if he messed up, he'd start all over again and start inking it. It'd be so easy today. All right, because of that time and, and there are a lot of other issues, we've done a lot of research on NASA at that time, and we knew that we had to kind of 
put in here some of the don'ts because it was too easy to mess with this thing. And so this is an unusual page, I think, in a sense, but it was things to avoid. Uh, there, most of the book is about guidance of what to do and, and how to make it better. But this one was about uh, no-nos. It had a page in it that re retaining the old seal, you know, for formal use and everything. A lot of people think we were just opposed to it, but no. Uh, there was, a, you know, statements about that, and we did keep it. Uh, Reaper art pages from that era, of course, were really talking about uh, cut, and, cut and paste. So uh, th this was the NAS logo itself. And then other than that, for a different size, you had to uh, uh, get photostats. Uh, the hierarchy here is expressed in two ways of handling headquarters, which had um, consolidated 11 different centers. And uh, then this Reaper art page shows how Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you know, how that works with, the, with headquarters. And of course, the PMS, we, we can use the term PMS, but this was a, you know, 185 and the perforated uh, chips. The dividers were like this. And they had the same titles on the back, so whether you went from front to back, you know, as you can see, it's sort of a 15 uh, punch uh, spiral binder. Um, some of the aspects of the program, I mean, business forms, it looks so simple. It took about a year to, to get these things reviewed and passed. This is also before electronic typesetting. So everything was um, almost handmade. Uh, the review by the federal government and many different agencies would get involved in this. So it was unbelievable. Uh, there were, uh, I think, four or five different type families were recommended. And this is a page of demonstrating how to use Garamond with, uh, inside the system. Individual pages on uh, this being very small brochures and leaflets to uh, give you a sense of what was possible in the system. Always trying to show how the logo would be placed and discreet, but uh, always on the front of a publication. Here you have a couple of real low-level kind of newsletters, um, but and on the right you see NASA being used as a STEM board. We're trying to make it more as versatile as possible, and some prototype uh, publication covers their mythical publications. The one on the right is uh, says something about the possibility is extra, extraterrestrial life. And uh, we had fun. We actually did about 80 of these. They were in the original presentation um, in DC. Some examples also of custom covers or hardbound covers and the like. And two posters, the one on the left is actually a comp we designed. We, they're very interested in NASA at that time having trouble with funding. And so um, the theme really underneath a lot of things was making space uh, uh, technology and research, bringing it down to Earth so that it applied to you and me. And obviously this is, as, as we were talking earlier about the public domain, that's what it is. This particular poster dealt with the heart, the studies in space, the weightlessness, and the pacemaker machines that came out of that. What we found in doing research was that there was no graphic designer on the staff of NASA. So, in other words, at each center, someone who was assigned to do publications, but the reality was that there was no trained graphic designer at any of them. So what you had instead was maybe a, you know, a, an illustrator someone who did kind of like uh, airbrush renderings and things like that, they say, well, you know art, so you put in charge of design. It was so bad that at two of the centers, they were secretaries. Now, that's not a, you know, that's not a statement. The fact is that they, they just didn't regard it high enough uh, or important enough, so they just passed it off on, on a secretary. So, it, this, so we decided we had to get extremely fundamental and deal with, with grids and try to explain how, why they would, would be useful and get, get jumpstart designs. And, um, and then here's a, a spread on relating a cover to text in different uh, size publications and different formats. 
the signing, which is a fairly large issue because NASA has such a public face and the public do come to the centers and they often have tours and educational things. So uh, we dealt with that pretty thoroughly and it had to be terribly inexpensive. We couldn't do anything real elaborate. There was external signs and then some internal design system to, to back that up. It was very cohesive. And uh, they see a lot of Helvetica, you know, in the years ahead, but this was, it was not so popular then, uh, but we did it. it it's, it's one of the last times I ever worked with Helvetica, actually. <laughs> so I have a, you know, it is. Well, it is a very simple, some thoughtful things were done. This is a, a gradation card, and if you're doing a vehicle and you had these vinyl cowls to put on the doors, you take this out to the vehicle and you put it alongside the paint job. It might be red, it might be blue or gray, and it just tells you whether you should be overprinting the type using black if it was a light-colored car or white like that. And there are some examples of uh, actually little higher level vehicle because they got to do it in uh, two colors. Very specific. There's a lot more that I'm showing. These are on a handful of the pages, right? But uh, because there were vinyl candles, they meant that they were split up and it had hand assembly. So uh, this is pretty much representative of, of the entire uh, ground fleet working, working, uh, you know, vans and buses, tour buses and, uh, you know, dumpsters and things like that. They had about five of these educational units uh, and they, what they did was they would tour high schools and the like and give space lectures. Anything that was going on was really interesting. Research had great success with this. They toured the country and you could book them and then they'd come see you in a month or so. Um, this is the Gulf Stream 2. Um, there were many, many craft in the fleet. Each one's different. An interesting side note here is that if you're doing a Ford Econoline or something, you can get the, the blueprints or the measurements from Ford Motor Company. Uh, these aircraft companies won't give you anything. Um, in, in other words, it's proprietary stuff. And sometimes it was the military, sometimes it wasn't. It's, uh, so what we had to do is go out in the field and measure the aircraft. And by that I mean, I don't mean I went out, but we would hire somebody and go in. And every craft in the fleet, that, there you go. There were many more than this, in fact, some gigantic helicopters. And um, each one was hand measured. And uh, it, it proved out to be work, because when they painted them, they were very honest to the schemes, and the stuff came out looking really great. Uh, space Shuttle went through a lot of different changes, with, and, and the real thing that drove this was that um, the scientists, engineers, finally told us where we could put graphics, you know, after all, what are we going to do, make the plane crash? No. So, it turns out there are only a couple of places that we could work with. If you remember, this was called, the shuttle was called the flying bathtub. Uh, it had ceramic tiles on the entire craft, and uh, so it really was critical where graphics were placed. You wouldn't think so to just look at this uh, offhand, but there, were, there was a couple of really important innovations in these graphics. It was the first plane, government aircraft, to ever fly with the name United States on it. Uh, it had always been United States of America. It was the first plane to fly with Helvetica font. It had been Air Force block lettering, if you remember that, it's like machine bold. And that the klutzy stuff, so we actually, this required congressional approval. Also the approval of the Air Force. Also, um, the NASA logo could not be bigger than the United States. Um, and like that. And the name of the craft, because there were many, many different shuttles. Uh, this is one of the things that I got very involved in and loved, um, satellites. And somebody asked, you know, well, what remains of the program? Well, these things remain, and why is that? Well, they're out flying in deep space. <laughs> so. <laughs> The administrator is not sending somebody out to repaint these aircraft. <laughs> now, he shouldn't have done this to begin with and reversed it, but that's a very deep story. Uh, the reality is, though, yes, there are a lot of these things out there and uh, uh, architectural treatments that were 
effective, including headquarters in Washington. He still has the old one. The uniforms cross the line. Everything seems so simple, but I can tell you that this, this little orange patch, and that's a red. It took about a year to develop, and it was because of the color of the threads, and it had to be flame retardant. And here we go again. You can't afford to have an accident. Uh, you're at, the designer's at fault. So we really worked this over and over and over, and finally got it done. Um, actually, this slide's out of place, but that's okay. Um, what I wanted to say about that was that it was at the same time, uh, which was a very vi busy time in life, when we were finishing the NASA program, which was several years, we had already taken on the Department of Transportation as another client. Uh, but he, we also were working for IBM and Champion International and Bristol Myers, and you know it was a heavy load. And then I got elected uh, president of AIGA, and um, frankly, it was a transitional time. It was a very, very difficult, critical time. We had financial problems. We, we had no executive director and a staff of four. Anyway, the point I'm making is that uh, it was a, like a triple hit, and uh, I almost moved. A cot into AIGA till we rallied and got that thing straightened out. Um, in a way, it's a, I offer a public apology. My wife is here and she's my business partner. My son is here, I'm very proud of, has a great firm here in uh, San Francisco called Blue Shirt Group. And um, they didn't see too much of me, you know, in those years. So, um, you know, make amends for that. Uh, just to finish up that thought, um, by the end of the two-year term, we had, uh, it was a New York club, basically, and I knew it had to go national, so I'm not taking full credit for it, but by the end of the term, we had, uh, instead of all New Yorkers on the board, we had uh, seven um, board members from around the country, one from San Francisco, one from L.A., and uh, all around the country, um, and we were developing chapters. So if we were 1,600 people, very New York-centric, Today, there are 70 chapters around the world, 25,000 members. So to, to many other people's credit, but that did work. And sometimes when you're in crisis, it's a big advantage because you make change in a hurry. And that's what happened with these. So in spite of all the business pressures and all that, this was a very fierce overlay, but we got through it. Some applications. So there you see the Hubble Space Telescope. The spacesuits were, uh, that one appeared in the video earlier. Um, it's the Gulfstream 1. Actually, this was used as a shuttle a trainer because they would go up and stall it out and then the astronauts would float around in it and get the idea of what that was going to feel like later in space. Very dangerous activity. Very. This is what I was just referring to, an architectural signing like this. Well, they, they've kept it in. I guess. Uh, okay, so a couple of years out after we introduced the program, I did uh, a set of, uh, you know, like public broadcasting film titles. This was an opening sequence of 30 second treatment, um, which had amazing sound behind it. Uh, when it started with the infinity symbol and worked its way through, by the time you got to the Da Vinci man that's appearing here, it was all synthetic sound up until then, and then, uh, you know, cello started overlaying the synthetic sound, and it was a beautiful resolution at the end. These were the first, to my knowledge, the first computer animations done in New York City, and they were done at Dolphin Productions. Here you have the logo doing a very soft space roll and landing quietly. This was all very hushed synthetic sound. I chased plane, uh, you know, a trial run for Enterprise. It was dropped off the big 747. They did a glide study, you know, to make sure everything was going to be okay. Very early on, the TS, STS-11 crew, with, you can see, all uniformed nicely. The launch pad at uh, Cape Kennedy. That poster I spoke of earlier, but, you know, the heart studies. Um, I did a series of posters for, um, that were sent to high school students, 
And um, here again, you see that theme that, that I related to earlier, that going to work in space, we wrote the headline and, and did that. And the idea was that, of course, your, your taxpayer dollars were, were working. There was, and that, of course, did happen. And the space technology has been a tremendous boon in terms of medicine and materials and, and uh, you know, human study. It's, it's very uh, productive area. The space station, of course, is an illustration, obviously. Um, in 1983, we made a joint decision that we needed to publish something, sort of a report for, for the managers at NASA, and uh, there were many reasons for that. One of them was to uh, just mark this point in time, but also to serve as guidance for both internal personnel, additional, it's almost like a style guide now that we're rolling and in place, and then also for uh, for contractors who had a lot to do with applying the program. So we did this, and um, it's a, s a simple uh, publication, staple publication, but it, it shows all things that have been accomplished already. This is uh, audio tapes and things here, um, printed materials, that little education unit I talked about. Here's a before and after on, uh, you know, conventional mail envelope. Signing and various applications also. Some of these things were designed by the centers at that point. We wanted to give them uh, a little pat on the back. Here's another at the top. NASA activities of before and after. The EVA spacewalk and uh, one of those posters we were talking about. Documenting the film titles, you know, now this can be referred to not as theoretical stuff, but as completed products and as sort of a how-to guide. And at the very end, we connected all the graphic coordinators. So if they had been sort of nobodies when this program started, now they began to hire what you call professionals. And, uh, you know, they started doing a lot better work. Uh, this actually has nothing to do with NASA as such, but I self-initiated a series of... Uh, posters for the Air and Space Museum. And uh, it was on the maiden flight of Columbia. Um, so they were on sale for several decades and did very, had very robust sales. Um, and of course, the sad thing is that Columbia was, uh, the demise was that when it just, you know, um, came apart over Texas and Louisiana on reentry and we lost the whole crew. These things hit very hard because when you're working on something like this, you feel like you know everybody, especially the astronauts who come quite close to them. Actually, over the years, I did tour a lot of centers, and I got to go in when they were building an Apollo or a unit Northrop or someplace in North American Rockwell. Well, now it's kind of it's just a fun exercise, but to show you how this stuff seeps into the culture and becomes kind of a, has a life of its own. So these are people that that sort of borrowed, and they borrowed heavily. Now, actually, Saturn, when you think about it, they named their new car. So Saturn tells you that they're copying. <laughs> but what's more obvious is the font. And uh, this one ended up in court. Um, not, we had nothing to do with it. Um, so it was NASA taking them to task. The reality is, over the years, I had to go to court a number of times um, to defend our logo being appropriated by somebody else. And yet, uh, even after it was uh, scuttled in 1992, so that, that was kind of a bitter pill uh, to do that. But anyway, here, here's just a few weeks ago. This is Boeing with one of the new jumbo jets, just borrowing the hell out of it, you know, for the, <laughs> uh, No problem. Oh, Barbara and I, Barbara and I are driving down the road and you know, this van pulls up next to me. I grab her iPhone. Boom. It's on the tail of something. I don't know what this is. It was sent to us. What you can see here is what the logo looks like with cross strokes. You know, it's very ordinary at that point. I, I don't know if you've ever, uh, I'm sure you haven't, but when the, in the original presentation when Dr. Fletcher was head of, of NASA, he had trouble with the logo. 
And he said, so his associate, Dr. Lowe, said, well, what's the problem, James? He said, well, you know, he said, I just, uh, there are no cross strokes in the A. And he said, yeah, that's right. And, well, so uh, he, there are no cross strokes in the A. And he says, yeah, what's wrong with that? He said, well, I don't think we're getting our money's worth. <laughs> now, think about that. All right, the point being that uh, we came a long way from that day. They did accept it and promote it. Um, and that, now what this is, is a TV series. You may know The Expanse. And if you look down here at the, the uniform patch, it has a certain familiarity. Uh, and our friend uh, Matt Damon, of course, in the blockbuster The Martian, borrows the font in some measure. Okay, this is a young little Austin Taylor who, um, you know, he's, he's three years old here. It's 1983. He's got his little shuttle and he's saying, just like my son Chris had one of those. And then his mother was so good as to bake him a space cake. And he was, um, he's a terrific fan. So he sent this, actually it's, uh, it's Taylor Austin, but she, he, he's all grown up now, and he's still a big fan, so he ordered several of the reissue books. And this is on a New York City subway. Just a few, a few weeks back, Hamish took that picture. I'm not even sure what it represents, but <laughs> it's more of the same, and it's awfully pretty. Okay, uh, so let's leave NASA behind for a moment. And... Um, but what I wanted to say was, we're going to look at some other style guides now, very briefly. But maybe now you can appreciate a little more. I've sort of been to outer space in a way, um, to the moon and back if you, in, in figurative terms. But I, I was born in 1934 in, uh, in Oklahoma, and I was raised on a farm there. So uh, it was the middle of the Great Depression, and it was Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. So maybe you can appreciate the kind of track that I've had, or maybe you can appreciate why my memoir is called Dust Bowl to Gotham, because I ended up in New York and immersed in design leadership there. So one of the things we did some years later, it was a year-long event for DuPont, and the, the theme for the, for the nylon 50th anniversary was Shaping the Future. Uh, this was a major science symposium, a very big deal, international thing. And I uh, designed this poster for it. Um, and then carried through on their annual report that year. There's a timeline at the bottom, and you see the, the 50th symbol at the bottom. It had the same feeling, but of course, just by using the diamond. Um, then we wrote guidelines for a lot of people, and now we had th th at least three or five products that could be documented and sent to people because there were many, many agencies and design firms who worked on the year. So, uh, you know, we were only established in the tone. Uh, I mentioned that we did DOT, which is a massive program because um, it incorporated railroads, highways, you know, air, sea, even the Coast Guard. But a subset of that, then we did FAA. And uh, I started, it, I passed over, but we had won a one of the first presidential awards for design excellence um, for NASA. And I was privileged to, to go to Washington and receive it from uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, this is the FAA, part of the FAA program, which had, they had about 30 different aircraft. So here are the sketches and schematics for that. It also had the bottom and the top of the plane on the other side. And a finished DC-9. This is a part of a program for uh, Fashion Institute of Technology, which um, was a consultant for over 30 years for them. And the guideline for them was change. So there never was anything written down except for their anniversary. And uh, the idea was that everything changed all the time. So here's a recruiting book um, from 1982, which went to high school students, sophomores actually, juniors, and then another version of that, this is actually 1999, 
has no resemblance, shape, color, or anything. One thing we tried to do was quote students all the time because they were always so high on this school. But in their 50th year, we did do a program, um, so a brand for the, for the, for the year. And um, these were the palette of colors we used. And then one fun aspect of it is we did a, a series of apparel that was sell, sold in the student shop. Um, what was neat about it was they had a bunch of merchandising majors, there were eight of them that we met with over, or, um, over time, months, and they were part of the selling of stuff. It was very, very active sales on the uh, apparel that year. I really enjoy this involvement. It's a, a Brazilian company named Mendez Jr. Um, they are huge steel manufacturer and they do construction projects all over the world. They're just quite marvelous. And they're great people. I just love working with the Brazilians. Um, anyway, here's the manual. It was also a spiral manual. It's very beautiful inside. And the thing that was unique about it was it was in English and Portuguese. Now, uh, how many of you have worked in Portuguese? All right. I, it is a very, very difficult language. And usually I, when I'm going to some place like that, I try to learn the language without, no way. So even getting it in written form right was, and it sets very long. You know, French sings along, well, I try Portuguese. Anyway, there was that, here's some of the end results of that. What I, you know, I just liked the people so much and went down for the present, final presentation and it was one of the nicest experiences I've ever had because we had a big room, it wasn't this big, but everybody had their earphones on, you know, and it was like the UN, and they were translating into French and, uh, and to English, what I was saying. Uh, this is a style guide for Pratt & Whitney. I did a lot of work, many years, for United Technologies, big company. And uh, Pratt & Whitney, you know, the jet en engine manufacturer. So, um, we figured out that what, what bound all their stuff together was a simple idea, it was a circle. So their oldest symbol is in the upper left corner is the eagle flying through that seal. And then the radial engines, they're up there too. So we just decided to keep that going. And all these publications and everything um, used the circle. And uh, it made a very cohesive program. And of course, we had the usual fonts and style guides on that too. This is a company, Atlantic Mutual, that specializes in marine insurance, in other words, a big shipping uh, kind of magnet. They, they went back uh, 200 years, I think. And the logo kind of, was, its derivation was kind of in the Admiral's piping on the uniform, made the A. Uh, this is their headquarters in lower Manhattan. And, uh, and we did six issues of this new magazine and it, it was very much tied in. And then we prepared written uh, guidelines and, and said sort of like, do it like that. In other words, just follow it. And they did a great job of continuing the magazine. There's a program for Cape Symphony Orchestra. It's built around a very lyrical symbol which uh, has gestures to music manuscript and uh, to the ocean. Um, and you see it across the board, an upper left performance calendar, an ad series here, and their first website at the bottom was very animated. In that case, again, written guidelines to go with things that have already been published. This is one of the later efforts, excuse me, recent, I should say. Uh, kid knowledge is a, is a new science teaching technique for uh, kindergarten through third grade. And uh, you see the double K. There were about 10, I think, of these applications which could be rotated, used in different ways. Down at the bottom, a marketing kit. The black thing in the middle is the teacher's manual. And the little kitties who are front to back are sort of reflecting the KK. This is their first marketing website that I did, and it, um, it was fun. It had some really neat music in it. Um, m much of my life, I've been immersed in music and uh, all, you know, chamber, uh, classical, and especially jazz. So I'm now on the board at the Napa Valley Jazz Society and just produced, uh, we do live shows and uh, we just did uh, two concerts for them. 
And, uh, you know, then I also established standards for the other producers who were doing shows so they could follow my templates and, and keep it going. They're responsible for their own promotion. This is Claire Dee, who's from San Francisco, a great singer. I presented out there twice. And uh, as referred earlier by Chris, this is um, AIJ medal. It was a centennial year for AIJ, so it was a real honor to receive that medal in 100 years. Um, the next year, which would have been last year, I was surprised to get the call when they asked me to design all the materials for the next gala. Um, as you can see, I'm, I go back to an idea I'm fairly well versed in, <laughs> and I use the theme of universe, and the reason I did was because um, that's the night that all our stars come out, you know, the design stars. So uh, we used that as the, as the anchor for everything and we acquired all these great images actually from NASA. And um, at the top you see there were about 40, 30 or 40 uh, web items. In the center is the triptych invitation to the event. And at the bottom, the 80-page manual, uh, I'm sorry, program for the evening. Um, it was a tremendous honor. It was done in a huge hurry, about a month and a half. Uh, and I was shocked that with 26,000 people, designers picked from, they picked this 81-year-old uh, to do their program. The guidelines for this one were, were rather casual, and they were done electronically. Uh, there was never anything printed. It was built around a typeface, around this logotype, with the shared A, and these, this celestial images. Um, we furnished all of that in all different forms, CMYK, red, green, blue, and the like. And then, as well, 40 beautiful, beautiful images in high res, so that the other designers, and there were quite a lot of them in, involved in uh, the event itself, which was spectacular, and I have to say, that night, um, we got lucky. And so after a brutal winter in Manhattan, um, we came up with this gorgeous starry night on the Hudson River. And it was absolutely out of central casting. I mean, it was, it was too beautiful for words. So this really worked. And it, on the bottom, you see some of those products. And now what we've got here is that I just wanted to say something. This is the reissue. Uh, as it's just come out and being delivered to all the backers across the country. If anybody in here ordered one, I hope you got it. Um, but just say something about Jesse Reed and, and Hamish Smythe. They, they both work for my old friend uh, Michael Beirut in the Pentagram office. And uh, they have been on a kick of honoring um, iconic pieces from uh, mid-century design in America. And they've just done a spectacular job. I can't say enough about them as designers and as people. Uh, it's been a wonderful working relationship. And it's okay for me to say tonight that this book, which has been just um, for those who back, on May 3rd we'll be in New York and announce that it would be a retail book. So... <laughs> For anybody who missed it the first time around, you'd be able to do that. Oh, and a really neat overlay on this is, as I speak, uh, this very afternoon, I think they've reached, uh, uh, not these same guys, but two French designers have, uh, are creating a French version of it. And uh, it's, it's in French, and it's for, as a teaching tool for high school and college. And so they've just completed their Kickstarter campaign, and they're going to be putting it out, which I'm very excited about that. Um, I should mention also that for a program that died for these last 25 years, and really for the whole 42 years, uh, it's hardly a month goes by that I don't get a call from some publisher or graduate student or somewhere, somewhere in the world that wants background on it and, uh, you know, visuals. And I send them a package of stuff every time over the internet. And, um, you know, the beat goes on. So this coming back to life is not something I ever expected. And frankly, um, it's launched a, a kind of speaking tour, which we'll be uh, enjoying coming up too. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, I just want to check my notes here.
Yeah, that's it. I, <laughs> well, it's enough. <laughs> Regardless, it's enough. And, uh, but, but, you know, basically, I wanted to say thank you to you all. It's Friday afternoon. I'm glad you hung in. And say what I like to say, onward. talking with us. So, so before it existed, we'll start with the NASA and we can move on from that. I think that's interesting. Is, I mean, you said yourself that it was, there wasn't, it was, there was some pioneering involved. There wasn't a lot of style guides, but it was, this was a new thing kind of. Was it, what, what was it like before then? Was, was the, was NASA must have had some branding first, right? Was it all a mess and you could just tell it needed a house cleaning? Oh, you mean at NASA? Oh, at yeah. NASA? <laughs> Well, yeah, because, I mean, you know, they had a process, and Annie Abel was behind this, National Endowment of the Arts, so they did a, a review of the agency. The process was they would, they would collect all the material from the agency, and then they brought in a, a panel of professionals, no one that was involved in the mm -hmm. bidding on the job. You know, was, I think that first program, they, they had about eight people were invited to, to submit RFPs. Um, and then that's... So you were the winner of these eight. Yeah, we, we won. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the reasons we won it is because Bruce uh, had been at Shemaif and Geismar and designed the bicentennial symbol. And I think it put us in a very strong position because I was so... It was brand new and everybody knew it and it was gaga about it. So, you know, that really helped our cause. Uh, the subsequent programs later, they go from 15 firms and pretty soon, I think, after we did the uh, FAA and the Corps of Engineers, they would be up to about 30 firms that they would invite. We would sort of win because of our track record. Okay. But um, anyway, it, with, with NASA, so they pull all this stuff together, and it was, it was very uh, tacky, you know. Really? And, yeah. Did you have and, to, was there even pricing war stuff, or did you not? Oh, even... not, not, not on the uh, RFP, no. Yeah, okay. Actually, the, the submission was strictly word there were no visuals so you had to respond really? with what you thought needed to be done uh, and you and you talked about your credentials really and, yeah and An RFP the, that's just a paragraph oh yeah, after yeah paragraph. paragraph after paragraph yeah. you know it's like uh, uh, going to prison or something so <laughs> it, in fact the little side story on that was funny yeah. because we had a secretary who was essentially blind we loved her uh, Barbara Brianzova and she but she she couldn't type because she couldn't see. Yeah. So the RFP had about a, you know, it was an era of a whiteout. Uh huh. Just covered so in whiteout. So this thing was covered with whiteout. <laughs> I think it added pounds to our RFP. <laughs> and, uh, but we got it anyway. I was the most shocked yeah. guy on the planet. Wow. Well, anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, we became very expert. But, but NASA's state was very poor. I, I, I missed a quote. I was going to pull a quote out of the, the reissue yeah. uh, intro where it talked about NASA. It was really 11 disparate centers yeah. who all resented headquarters. Uh, and uh, really, yeah, funding uh, was you know, they're very independent. They were jealous of each other and everything. Mm -hmm. So it was a, quite a state. And one of the reasons that, that there were these problems, it went on for years and years, because they resented everything coming out of Washington. So it was not an environment that you'd, you'd think it'd be perfect, and they were leading edge and forward yeah. thinking. Nah. Yeah. Did it bring them together afterwards? Was it? Um, well, it never did. Um, what happened was that, yes, I mean, you could see we had results yeah. when everything was right. implemented and like that. But it was a schism between the old guard and the young employees. Uh -huh. All the young people, almost a person, loved the new one. And uh, the old ones were hanging on to the, you know, sort of the flyboy, so, yeah, yeah, the well, era where, you know, let's go out and fly around at a great speed uh, kind of guys. And, um, you know, so that never really was settled. And no, when, there's a great solution for yeah, that at yeah. any situation. So it, the implementation of it is unbelievable. It, it was absolutely everywhere. I, some of us struggle to get the person sitting next to us to use our style guide that we created. And this was fun. Everything was, well, it was so on there. And you know what was neat about it, Chris, is that, that um, it had the, probably the most public face of, of certainly any federal agency and better than most corporations. I mean, you'd be hard pressed, unless it was an IBM or somebody, to match that because yeah. it was manned spaceflight. 
And that, that grip people like nothing else has, I think, in this country. Right. I mean, it really pulled people together, and they were, they were totally glued to the whole idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it was very exciting. They were ready. I mean, when, they, when you got the job, they were so ready to take your work and just start, yeah, they, start making they, they did, and we, and we got to, you know, implement it very quickly. Um, you know, there's always the issue of money. And, yeah, what'd you, you bill know, for yeah. this anyway? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Yeah. You wouldn't believe how low it was. Oh. Well, let me put it this way, because um, this question comes up all the time. Oh, wow. uh, I was Chris, worried I wrote a very rude ordinary question, question mark on the very prosaic question. <laughs> no, um, I would say that in general we we were probably making about a quarter of what a corporate fee would yield. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it never got better. <laughs> it never got better. In other words, on the last program for the Corps of Engineers, it was still the same, uh, you know, mm -hmm. thirty-four dollars an hour. After this, though, all yeah. the subsequent clients double. Yeah. Um, was there pushback? Was Was there any? You know, you'd deliver something, or would, would one of these seven organizations be like, "No, that's you know, we're going to do it this way," or "We wish you would have done it this other way." Was there any battles and fights with any of it, or was with just, the centers? Sure, or, or anybody at all. Would somebody come in and be like, oh, no, no, no. Well, the centers were, as I say, were, and, and I have several relatives that work for NASA still, and they tell me nothing's changed. But they just resented this, and they, they're very fierce uh, people. They're very talented, you know, in, in a JPL or a, a Ames Research Center or something like this. So they kind of resent things, uh, anybody telling them around. There's also an engineering mentality there. And a lot of the engineers, you know, you, you've worked with plenty of them, maybe. Sure, yeah. But, uh, you know, the sense was that, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. And so I don't think they ever really uh, completely got it. But then they settled down and uh, as the stuff was beautifully rendered, and you're correct in saying that the public saw it very quickly. It was, you know, they got the automatic television coverage, so it was really amazing uh, acceptance yeah. for the public. Got some freebies out of it. Well, did I have it right that there was no designers at NASA? There, there weren't any designers, at, oh, as, as we know, the, a graphic designer right. with training like that. There were a, a great number of uh, technical illustrators. Yeah. They had to Which have you it. converted into designers. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, you know, they, they said, you must be able to do this. It wasn't a high uh, respect for design yet. Yeah. But that changed, and we, hired, we got them to hire an internal graphics coordinator in Washington. Yeah. And then he hired people at different centers, uh, and there you go. Mason might have needed him it, to that. It took, yeah, I it took a long you, time, yeah. That you had to push Helvetica through Congress. That's, <laughs> that's crazy. Well, maybe I misconstrued it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let's go with that. No, but they, I, I can tell you this. We had another congressional approval, which were, was for a two-color letterhead for NASA. And the reason it was justified using the NASA red on it for headquarters, because they had this public face, and it was really important. There's no agency that had this, um, you know, advantage, and the public just couldn't get enough of it. So they got a congressional approval to do a two-color letterhead. Everything else black and white. Well, congressional approval for two colors. Yeah. This three was right out. Pretty far out. <laughs> <laughs> um, after the, you know, post post NASA, were you a, were you a style guy? Was the phone ringing for people that are like, do this for us? Well, I think uh, almost everything we touched after, and there were a lot of programs, even at the state level or uh, corporate level. Mm -hmm. And then they were automatic. Style guides were produced. Sometimes, as I showed you, some of them, some of them were uh, just spiral binding, some were uh, stapled. And then in the last few years, we did mostly um, electronic. But uh, I, it's interesting because I've been talking to other designers and uh, and especially like Jesse, for instance, at Pentagram, and I said, well, what does this mean for you? And he said, oh my God, he says, it's like a big movement back to style guides. And I said, are you actually doing physical manuals? He said, uh, yep. Yeah, <laughs> he well, said, we are. We, 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 we tried it electronically for years, but now we're going back to something that people can hold in their hands and they seem to respect it. And so the, that's a, is, the, is the binder just iconic or is the idea with the binder is that you open the binder and be like, this page is now outdated, it's no longer. So that, we'll was, that, was the fun, that was the function that drove right. it, the decision. It was nothing more than that. Okay. Um, you know, you could replace the things you could add to them because we did supplements for, you know, seven or eight years and added okay. to the manual. And uh, so it made it very, very flexible, and it's a workbook. So, 
you know, kind of makes sense. People would take a aesthetic. page to their desk if they didn't own the manual inside of it. Oh, so, you know, they could actually, and or photocopy it or something. Okay. When you see design systems today of similar scope, are you like, are people, are people doing a good job? You see Delta or something or some other airline, are you like, mm -mm. you're doing okay? Or do, or... You know, I think uh, I kind of stay out of those arguments, but uh, <laughs> the reality is I haven't seen many that I feel were better than what they replaced. I think American Airlines is an example of that. Um, but Delta, you know, they say the world changes, and, and what you see, what I don't like about some of them, they look like crash test vehicles, you know what I mean? Uh, they put so much stuff on the tail, it looks like it's disintegrating, you know? And it really should look like airflow or something, you know, yeah. like it's natural. And so there's been a lot of showing off, and, and I, I suppose there's a manual behind every one of them. I don't know if that's your question, but, you know, they definitely, uh, they're, tendency is to treat it more like our whole society treats everything in a temporary way. It's nanoseconds, you know, our attention span is almost gone, shot. <laughs> you know, so uh, a program, I think, uh, you, you know, I think there, there was a reference this morning that, um, um, you know, if, if, a, a trademark or a mark or a brand, you know, can't last very long. You know, it's disposable. I think that set in where you can't that, expect it to be have permanence. We were always about permanence. Yeah, I remember that. As long as it, I mean, most of these things that you see, they're 30, 40 years, um, and, and they haven't changed, really. Here we have a program that was scuttled, but it's kind of back. And so that's encouraging. But I think there is, a, what happened partly, I know in, in this world that we've been talking about, the web and everything, is that designers, and, and by the way, we're totally computer-based from day one, whenever they were introduced. But designers, a lot of it, it's, it's so many tricks you can do. So they made the marks more and more complicated, and gradations, and this and that, and looks just going they could. through, just because it could. And what's happened is kind of, you probably have talked about this plenty, because of the small mobile device, it's forcing designers to go back to simpler solutions and sometimes two-dimensional solutions that look good on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So everything goes around and comes around. Goes around, comes yeah. around. I, I, do you think, you think in, in 30, 40 years, some of us will be at a design conference with, with alien language? <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize for that, but... No, uh, no it's... <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's so much Greek and you're tweaking yeah. it and it's like, okay, so you can make a case, this is progress. And uh, that's too deep to go into, okay? But, um, you know, as a society, I mean, one thing I think you have to appreciate about what, what we did in that era is, um, and, and even up to some degree up to current times, because I'm still working every day. Um, you, you know, you're, you're trying to create something that has value and, and it lasts. Today, it's so complex. And you can see from your teams, I mean, you've got so many people that have to be involved and everything. And so a lot of our work was intuitive. You know, it's cut stuff. Okay. Yeah. You, you solve things. The intelligence, I think, is there. And the commitment is there that we took our work very seriously and did research we had to do. But in the end, you did it your way. And uh, it was very intuitive solutions. And I think that probably can't apply to the world we're talking about now. And there's, in other words, you could almost operate in a vacuum, alone, hmm. Hmm. you know, in a closet. Whereas um, today, to, 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 to do a, especially a retail website, you know, for uh, Walmart or, you know, somebody yeah. that scale, PepsiCo, it's, uh, it requires hundreds of people to be involved in the process. And you are right? five. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we grew to, at one yeah. point, we were 60 in New York, but, uh, but that's still small, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I think that we, we, this will all shake out. I wrote a piece recently about the awkward state for design right now, and eventually it will all come around and it will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be what it was, but it will be okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Richard.